Things will not ever be as good as they'd be. But I've got good news for you. When heaven comes in view, one glimpse you'll know that the best is yet to come. Some call it heaven. I call it home. Some call it dreamy. Let me dream on. Some call it heaven. All right, if you would, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1 with me this morning as we're going to continue to speak on some of the issues. And then let me encourage you to come back next week for the finale. Everybody in 1 Peter this morning, 1 Peter chapter 1, if you would, please, for our reading of our scripture today. And then we're going to get into the message that God has for us concerning the current day issues uh, here in our country. We're commanded by the Lord to speak out on issues. Uh, one of the prophets said so. Uh, even some of our founding forefathers encouraged us to do so. We know that Daniel was a statesman and a politician in Babylon. And for 70 years he spoke on the issues in Babylon. He was also a prophet of God. And he also spoke the word of God concerning those things. So we're going to be looking at that. First Peter chapter 1. The Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To the strangers scattered throughout. We're the strangers today, my friend. We're the believers that are scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethany. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith. You see, you're not kept by your works. You're not kept by your deeds or your merits or your efforts or goodness or righteousness. No, you are kept today by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Thank God we have security in Christ today. It's not dependent on my performance or what I do or I don't do. It's dependent on what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary and his finished work. Can I get a witness for that today? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the wonderful music we've heard from the choir. Uh, how we need you every hour. Oh God, how we need you every hour. Lord, thank you for uh, the fact that we can bow the knee before the King of Kings and the King of Glory. Uh, because we know him personally today. And Lord, we are reminded that one day every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to the glory of God the Father. So Father, we humbly bow before you this morning. Our hearts, our minds, our will, our attitudes, Lord, and our motives, that you would search our hearts today by your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask the Spirit of God now would come and teach us 
the things of God. Teach us the Word of God. Guide us into all truth. And Lord, we rely on the Holy Spirit's help today more than ever. Lord, bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us through your Holy Spirit. And may we have freedom and liberty today to stand and proclaim your truth. And Father, we'll thank you for it. And we'll ask you today to speak to hearts here and abroad and around the world through the media, television, internet, YouTube, iPads, iPhones, tablets. Father, use it uh, today for Jesus' sake and for his glory that a multitude of people will be saved. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. As last week, as you know, we looked at the record of Scripture, right? Amen. This is the record. The Scripture is the record. And here's what we believe, ladies and gentlemen. We believe the record of the Scriptures of the Word of God. We believe the record of the Scripture regarding the truth of its inerrancy and its interpretation. We believe in regarding marriage, the record that's in the Scripture, that its origin is divine from God Almighty from day one, period. Not what the Supreme Court has said. We believe in its operation is defined in the Word of God. Then we looked, at, we looked at the rejection of a nation. The rejection of a nation. And we looked at the fact that, first of all, the culture today, our culture in the United States of America, has rejected the Word of God. We have rejected the biblical principles and teachings of God's Word, of His pattern, His design, and His way. And unfortunately, that is sad, but may I say that's wrong. That's an error that is not right or correct and we saw that in the book of Romans then we pick it up this morning where we left off not only do we see the rejection of a nation I want you this morning to see with me the rejection of the courts the courts have rejected the Word of God the courts have rejected the principles and the concepts and the teachings of the Word of God this morning and that took place majorly on June the 26th, 2015, when the highest courts of our land turned their backs on God's Word. They have rejected the Word of Almighty God, and we're in trouble. You understand that? The Supreme Court, and uh, there they ruled five to four that same-sex marriage is a constitutional right. They nullified all state laws concerning the issue. Twenty-six states were nullified at that very moment in that hour. And in that moment and in that hour, they institutionalized what God calls sin. Okay? They said that it's going to be the law of the land. And they did not take a neutral position on this, but instead they affirmed what God condemns that they are for, and, and by doing so, they are for what God is against. You understand that, folks? That's where we're at. Now, I know some of you older seniors, and, and I'm getting there. We would never see this in America. Well, you're seeing it. You would have said this would never happen in America. It has happened. You would be saying that this, this is not so. This cannot happen. It's not going to take place uh, in this great land of the home of the free and the brave and supposedly in one nation under God. But it has. And it's going to continue to do so. And so we have a beautiful picture. How many of you are familiar with the wonderful statement that's always used by the media, by the lawyers, and everybody else, separation of church and state? They haven't got a clue what that means. And if they do, they're misquoting it and misusing it. When our founding forefathers left England, because of England, the state was involved in control of the church. And they wanted religious freedom and a right to practice their faith and religion apart from the state, from the crown, from the king, and all of that. So they marched out in a journey to America. And they landed there on Plymouth with their 1560 Geneva Bible uh, there and said, this will be the book. This is what we will study. This is what we will follow. This is what we will believe. And from that point on, it went and there and there. But not so today. Separation of church and states is real simple, folks. Here it is. 
The state is not to get involved in the church. Simple. They are not to govern our faith, our practice, our worship. They're not to have anything to do with it. But it does not disqualify the church getting involved in the state. Because we are allowed to. We are citizens. We pay our taxes. We were born here and so forth. And we have a right to get involved. We have a right to vote and go out and vote. We have a right to run for political office. We even have the right, yes, to become the president of the United States of America. But the church, the state, is supposed to stay out of the church. Mind your own business. And leave us alone. After all, what are we doing? We're not hurting you. We're not causing trouble and problems. We're not breaking the law. Leave us alone. But they don't want to. I'll draw your attention to the Old Testament with me. I found a perfect, beautiful example of this. Turn to 1 Kings, if you would. 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 26 through 32. And then when you find that, uh, also open up to 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. All right, everybody with me, and uh, we're looking at the courts have rejected the word of God. They have turned their backs, the Supreme Court, on the Bible, and they have bowed to the altar of this culture of today. They have disregarded God in their decision. Everybody in 1 Kings? All right, in chapter uh, 13, 12 there, chapter 12. We have the story here of Jeroboam, who's the king of the north, and Rehoboam, who is the king of Judah, the south, in the nation of Israel. All right, that's what's kind of going on, all right? Now, wait a minute. Now, get this in mind with you, okay? Let's see how smart we are today. See if we're all smarter than a fifth grader, amen? So I told somebody last week, I need to go on that show. I'd probably fail. All right, praise God. I'm glad nobody said amen. Just some of you chuckled a little bit. Thank you for being kind. I appreciate that today so very, very much. Okay? But put your thinking caps on. With the nation of Israel and so forth, they had kings. Okay? And then they also had, and what would the kings represent? The, it starts with a P. They would represent the political side. They would be what we call today president. They governed the land with, with rules and laws and government, and that's what the king did. Who were the ones that were to handle the religious side? The priest. The Levites. The tribe of Levi. They were appointed by God, and they would take care of the worship and the offerings and the sacrifice and all that stuff that went on. And the kings were to stay out of the affairs of the worship. But when we get to this passage of Scripture, we find uh, Rehoboam, uh, Jeroboam, he's the king of the north, the president of the north, that's Israel, okay? King of the south is Judah, that's Rehoboam. All right, are you with me? Say amen. All right, and so he decides he's going to get into the affairs of worship. And he says, after all, he says, Jerusalem is too far for you guys to go and worship. Now, wait a minute, what did God say? Where were they to go to worship? God said they were to go to Jerusalem. That's what God said. But the king says, ah, forget it. I'm going to make you, I'm stepping in here. I'm going to make a couple of golden calves, and I'm going to put one down in Bethel, and I'm going to put one over here in Dan, and you guys are going to go there, and you're going to worship uh, the, the idols. And, and he brought them right back into what we call idolatry. Remember, he represents the state. He represents the political side. But now he stepped in, and he's going to take care of the religious side, which was not none of his business. But if you look at the geographical map, and he told them, he says, Now, when you go to, the, the, to Bethel or to Dan, and you go to worship the gods that I've set up, the calves that I've set up there, he said, I want you to bow down to them. Now, if you look at the geographical map location, if they were to go and to bow down in Dan to the golden idol, they'll, you'll notice that their backs were away from Jerusalem. You know what the Supreme Court did? They turned their backs on the Bible. The Word of Almighty God. 
and got involved in the church. I hope you're with me on this. You can see it there. And look what he says there in verse 28. The king took counsel. The president took counsel with the Supreme Court. Come on now, can I get a witness on this? And he told them not to go up to Jerusalem. They didn't need to go there. And then you can see all that went on as you read it. Then I want you to see something very interesting in 1 Kings 13, what happens. Are you ready for this? Everybody look at your Bibles in 1 Kings, all right, in chapter 13. And let's look at verse number 1. And behold, somebody talk to me, come on. There came a man of God. Here comes the prophet. Here comes the preacher. Here comes the pastor. Here comes the man of the word of God. Now look at this. Oh, this is beautiful. Out of Judah, no less, the southern kingdom. And how did he come? He came by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now wait a minute. What's the president doing at the altar burning incense? Come on now, talk to me. And watch this. Circle the word in there. He cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. Are you all with me? We need today for you to pray more than ever than you've ever prayed. That God will raise up or call out his so-called men, not his, but the ones who think they are, in, his, in the pulpit across our land and to stand up and to speak up and to speak out against the sin of this land. Thus saith the Lord, this is wrong. This is not right. This is immoral. This is perversion at the highest act. Come on, where are our preachers standing in the pulpits today proclaiming the truth? It's one thing to do it here in the four walls, and that's as far as it goes. You're going to have to get out there in the public and take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I encourage every pastor in church today, get on the radio, get on the internet, get on television, get on everything you can possibly get on, and thus saith the Lord and proclaim the word of Almighty God. Speak up, speak out in the name of the Lord. Or we'll go public. Praise God. We might lose some things. Praise God. We might even go to jail. Praise God. We'll have revival in the jailhouse. What rocked the jailhouse at midnight? And it wasn't ever Elvis Presley singing jailhouse rock. Now notice what the man of God did. I want you to see this. He cried out. He stood against the altar of incense and he cried out against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, look what he said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall the offerings of the priest and the high priest that burn incense shall come upon them, men's bones shall, uh, shall be burnt upon thee. And he goes on and he says, this is a judgment that's coming. Josiah wasn't born until 352 years later when this prophecy was completely fulfilled of what the prophet was saying. But in the meantime, he said, I'll tell you what, uh, Jeroboam, God's going to give you a little sign that he's going to do this. Here's what's going to happen. The incense is going to burn up here. The altar's going to burn up. The ashes are going to uh, fall off and roll out. And you're going to see that before your very eyes this day as a sign as to what's coming of the judgment of God. Now, here's what's interesting. The Bible says that uh, it was a Jeroboam, right? That's who we're with. Jeroboam was at the altar burning incense. Did you notice when he stuck his hand into the altar, nothing happened? Come on, watch this. But when he heard the man of God cry out against him, the Bible says he said, take hold of the man of God. And when he pulled his hand out from the altar, his hand withered up so that he could not take hold of the man of God. I want to tell you something. If you're a man of God today, you don't have to worry. No weapon formed against you shall prosper in the name of the Lord. Stand up with your rod. What do you got in your hand? A Bible, a stick. I don't care what it is. It's mighty weapon in the hand of an almighty God. Judgment came upon Jeroboam. 
And he got to take a look a little bit what was going to happen. And I'm telling you, Supreme Court, and the president and all of his staff, you have come against God Almighty. You're in trouble. You're not going to win. Forget it. But the sad thing is, remember people what we talked about several weeks ago? And we brought the, brought the message on making choices. They were free last week, two weeks ago, to make the choice. And they made it. But they're not free to choose the consequences. The choice now will choose the consequences. And guess what? Mr. President and your staff and cabinet and administration... Guess what, you five on the Supreme Court of our highest land? It's going to affect you. It's going to affect those around you. And eventually it's going to affect this country. My, my, my. Folks, we're headed, again, as I said last week, there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There's going to be a pot of God's wrath. You read it in Revelation 15 and 16 and 17. The wrath of Almighty God will be pulled out, poured out. Oh my, my, my. Now I know this all sounds kind of down and gloom and dreamy, but it's not. This is the Bible. This is the Word of God. We're to speak out against these truths. We're to warn the nation. Now let me go as we move on here quickly. All right, so we've seen that. Let's look at the third thing, number three this morning. Thirdly, what's going to happen? What's the result of Bible rejection? What is the result of Bible rejection? Everybody with me on this? I'll tell you, first of all, number one, A there in your outline, we're going to see the diminishing of biblical homes. We're going to see the diminishing of biblical homes. You want to know why? Because our Supreme Court now has said that this way of life and this lifestyle is acceptable, it's normal, it's law, it's right, it's constitutional. And so now we're going to teach it even more to our kids in our schools and so forth and so on. And it's going to become a normal thing. And this is what my kids, my grandkids, and my great grandkids are going to inherit. And they're going to grow up under that type of teaching and all of that stuff. And I'll tell you what, there's going to be the diminishing of biblical homes in America. And so goes the home, goes the nation. You watch it. You mark it down. It's going to happen. You see, because why? They have broke away from God's divine plan and origin. That what? What is it? Here it is again. For this cause, notice, now talk to me. Shall a, now what's a man? Male. Shall leave his, male gender, father, male. So, so far we got three males involved in this, right? And Oh, we just got in the mother, the female. And shall be joined unto his, male, wife, female. And they too shall be one flesh. That's God's divine plan. But when we go away from that and we drift away from that, we're going to see the diminishing of biblical homes. That's why, again, on that, that, based on that in Genesis there, that's why Jesus came back and says, and he says to you and I, he says to the courts, he says to the Supreme Court, hey, listen up. I am the truth. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man's coming unto the Father except by me. That's God's plan and divine plan and origin. You're not going to change that. But we'll see the diminishing, I believe, of biblical homes. Secondly, I think this one's a sad one and and really alarms me. And that is the uh, marginalization of Bible believers. The marginalization of Bible believers. That's getting us confined and putting us in a box and drawing the line and we get narrowed down and and it's going to be to where we're going to become so marginal, you know, there's not going to be much of us around. That's what marginalization is, okay? And and what's going to cause that? I'll tell you what I believe is going to cause that. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verses 3 through 11. The nine Beatitudes there. Look at verses 10 and 11. He said, you're going to have persecution. Men are going to persecute you. Tribulation is coming. Jesus said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome. Job said, man's days born on the woman are full of trouble. And Jesus said, in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, they shall persecute you. They're going to speak all manner of evil against you. And all kinds of things, folks. America is not going to get away with it, so we need to wake up and wise up. 
as this new minority continues its discrimination towards Christians, and then we're going to see a rise in that rapidly coming. And it's going to marginalize us. Peter put it this way, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Hallelujah! And of thee the part that is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his his behalf. I'm telling you, in the days ahead, it's going to cost to be a Christian. This easy life living that we've had all of these years, and easy believism as well, but just easy uh, 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 and everything, and folks, that's coming to an end. That's shut, I mean, we need to wake up to this. I mean, we, we need to find out what's going on here. Are you with me? Say amen. Praise God. Let's move on. All right, so we see that. And I, I have tons of quotes here. Like I said last week, I have 52 pages of notes and it would take us about a month to get through this. So we're not going to. But I have tons of quotes from our chief justices. Chief Roberts, certainly most of all, Justice John Roberts, uh, most of his quotes. Uh, Samuel Alito, we have his quotes and so forth concerning these things. Let me just share one or two of them with you uh, on Chief Justice here. He says, I'm going to read the latter part of this we, about the same-sex marriage and couples and all that. Unfortunately, people of faith can take no comfort in the treatment they will receive from the majority today. And I quote Chief Justice John Roberts. Let me quote to you what Samuel, uh, Chief Samuel Ad, uh, Alito said. I assume that those who cling to old beliefs, and by the way, that's me. Hey, I hope you too as well. will be able to, he says, you're going to only be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by the governments, employers, and schools. By imposing its own views on the entire country, the majority facilitates the marginalization, that's where I got that one from, by the way, of many Americans who have traditional ideas. Recalling the harsh treatment of gays and lesbians in the past, some may think that the turnabout is fair play. But if that sentiment prevails, the nation will experience bitter and lasting wounds, just as Samuel Alito. That's why Peter said, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, what does that say? What does all that mean? That means yesterday I was a believer. That means today I'm a bigot. That means tomorrow I'm a criminal. But it makes no difference. I'm going to follow biblical truth. And I hope you are too and will too. Talking with some of our, one of our men this week, and, and I was talking with uh, my dear wife this week, and we were talking about, uh, you know, things, the way things are going, and what are we going to do, and so forth, and how are we going to come next week, and you'll find out. Bring your shouting clothes and megaphone with you next, next week. We're going to praise God and hoop and holler what we're going to do, but right now we've got to, unfortunately, look at the bad side, the dark side. But we were talking, and she says, what's going to happen? What are you going to do when all this comes down on the church and what it is? And it already is, by the way. Okay? Already is. I said, well, we're the old ship of Zion. And I said, the captain goes down with a ship. So when I'm standing on the conning tower or the deck, and I will salute to you, brothers and sisters, Farewell. I'll see you on the other side. I'll see you in glory. Bloop, 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 bloop. There goes the ship. One of my men said this week, and he said, Pastor, I'll be standing right beside you. I said, praise God. We're going to have to take a stand, people. The third thing I see happening not only are the results, there's the diminishing of the biblical home, there's the marginalization of Bible believers. I see a tremendous threat today against Christian education. A tremendous threat today against Christian education, and it's already happening. Okay? You understand that? 
the, 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 from right on down. Humanism, by the way, is against Christian education. Okay? It's coming. You ought to read the sword of the Lord. You ought to get it. I've got ten copies out there. I get here every week. Supreme Court stumbles, airs twice in two days. The article here, the first one is about the passing of Obamacare. And the repercussions and what it's going to cost us. Then the next one is, what will the ruling on marriage mean to the country and to Christians? And he goes on and tells us the policies. Then under noteworthy news, administration ready to force some faith-based organizations to hire homosexuals. You ought to get this in your home. Because they'll keep you up to date what's happening and going. The real news. The real truth of what's taking place and what's happening. You're not going to get this from Washington and for the current administration, nor the media. You understand that? You need to know what's going on. We can't put our stick our heads in the sand anymore, church. We've got to get them out of the sand and know what's to happen. You see, I, I forget the quote or how it goes. Maybe you will say it, though. But, uh, but, uh, but an educated country or people or learned people or something, and if not, you have just the opposite. Amen? We've got to educate our people. We've got to inform our people, and I see a threat coming against it, something fierce, and it already has, and it already is. Especially, it'll start with those that are taking federal aid. Any kind of Christian organization, college, school, university, that's the first place it's going to come down on. Then from there, it'll be to our Christian colleges, seminars, Bible colleges, right on down from the high school to Christian school education is going to come under a tremendous threat under all of this garbage. Matter of fact, by the way, no one, should think that the IRS implications will stop just with colleges. Religious high schools, grade schools, and any other religious institution will face the same outcome. And this includes churches. I'll tell you one of the first things I believe is going to happen. They're going to take away your tax exempt for your giving. I see that coming. That all your contributions in giving to the church, the IRS is going to stop that. Hoping that you'll quit giving. Then when you quit giving, it shuts churches down. That's their objective and their goal. But let me ask you, church, why do you give this morning? Do you give because you love Him? Do you give because of what He did for you on the cross? Or do you give just simply because the government gives you a tax break? You see, we're going to get marginalized. Trust me, it's coming. You see, you can't stop giving. Just because the government takes it away from you. Or if we got the wrong attitude and, and motives. I believe we're going to see the taxation come not only in all the schools and, and faith-based organizations and all that. I believe we're going to see it come on the church. They're headed in that direction. And the administration are working feverishly with it to have all of this take place. So what does that mean? I love this property. I don't worship it, but I love it. I love the buildings and the church here, but I don't worship it. Because if I do, then it's idolatry. But I'll tell you what. If they want to tax this place and put us out of business, at least as far as that goes, we'll go outside and I'll stand on an old soapbox and we'll preach. And if we don't have electricity, God will get to raise up a stronger voice and give me a megaphone that I mean it's really big and loud. And we will proclaim the message of Jesus Christ regardless if we have to go out and face the flies and the mosquitoes and everything else. Glory to God. It's coming. It's already happening. You can read the articles of pastors and churches that are facing it in lawsuits. So trust me. Fourthly, their D, I see a fourth thing happening because of this rejection. And that is the positioning of America for judgment. America has lined herself up and put herself in a position for God's judgment. And folks, we're not going to be exempt from it. You're not going to be able to hide from it. It's going to have an effect on all of us. Listen to what the Bible says. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Woe. By the way, that woe is a judgment. Are, are you all understanding what a woe is? It's a pronounced judgment. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitterness for sweet 
and sweet for bitter. Now here's one I found that nearly shocked my socks off my feet. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 1. You don't have it. Write that down in your notes. Jeremiah 23 and verse number 1. Notice what God says. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Woe to you pastors that are approving of this, sanctioning it, having a part of it. It's okay. Aligning with it. Joining up with it. Woe to you pastors. Trying to warn you and help you. You better get off the fence. Get on the right side. Whosoever is on the Lord's side, let him come. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The line's been drawn. You're going to have to decide what side you get on. And we're going to find out in the days ahead. As I believe churches more and more will bow to the government. And all of this because of losing their tax exempts, their benefits, and all that kind of stuff. Woe to those that call good evil and evil good. And woe to you pastors that destroy and scatter my sheep. Matter of fact, if you read the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus himself personally gave 30 woes just in the four Gospels. You'll find 106 times the woes of pronouncement of judgments that are coming in the Bible. God help us. God help us. I'm telling you, the wrath of God is going about to be poured out. We find that word 47 times in the New Testament and 151 times in the Old Testament of the wrath of Almighty God. Preacher, man, this all sounds doom and gloom. No, this is telling you the truth. It ought to have a positive effect to get right with God and to turn around and get saved. Do you realize we could stop all this in a minute? Do you realize that all the garbage they're forcing on our teachers to teach in the public schools across America, if they would just rise up together and say, we're not going to do it? What are you going to do? You're going to fire and get rid of a couple of million teachers? You're going to have a tough time doing that. And if about three or four or five million preachers would march on Washington, you know what? We might get something done. Majority's decision is an act of will, not legal judgment. The court invalidates the marriage laws of more than half the states and orders of the transformation of a social institution that has been formed for the basis of human society for a millennial. And he quote John Justice goes on to say, and he says, Just who do we think we are? Chief Justice John Roberts. I like this one. Dr. Franklin Glaram. The Supreme Court of the United States has ruled today that same-sex marriage is legal in all 50 states. With all due respect to the court, it did not define marriage. And therefore, it is not entitled to redefine it. Long before our government came into existence, marriage was created by the one who created man and woman, Almighty God. And his decisions are not subject to review or revision by any man-made court. God is clear about the definition of marriage in his holy word. And he quotes Genesis 2, 24. He goes on to say, I pray God will spare America from his judgment. Though by our actions as a nation, though we give him less and less reason to do so. It's coming. Thomas Jefferson, one of our presidents of the United States, and I quote, And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? A conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated but with His wrath? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that justice cannot sleep forever. Thomas Jefferson. That's a long time ago. I have four minutes left. Now all this sounds so down and discouraging. 
And I know it does. It gets to even preachers. We'd all rather preach on Jesus loves me, this I know, amen? And that's a doctrinal truth. That's a doctrinal as truth as you can get. There's no question that Jesus loves you. And you know who told you that? The record of the Scripture regarding the truth of the Scripture. But let me close in this. And like I said next week, Lord willing, the finale, bring your shout and close. You're praising the Lord, close. Because this is all what's going on. Then what are we going to do about it? I'll tell you next week, Lord willing. But I close with this. I'm not discouraged. May sound like it, but I'm not. I'll tell you first of all why I'm not discouraged. Why? Because I believe in all of my heart that the gospel of Jesus Christ is more powerful than any government. It's more powerful than any Supreme Court. It's more powerful than all the kings and the armies of the world is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe to the Jew first and also to the Gentile friend Washington Supreme Court you will not stop the gospel of Jesus Christ it's more powerful than you can ever imagine it's more powerful than a nuclear bomb is the gospel of Jesus Christ hallelujah can we get a witness and a praise in God's house today oh my friend don't go out of here with your head down and discouraged because we have a gospel that's more powerful than a locomotive. It's more powerful than a jump of a single tall building. It's more powerful than a bullet. And it's not a man flying around with a cape. It is the king of kings and the king of glory. Hallelujah. Don't you get discouraged. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Secondly, I believe the reason for hope is that many times in great spiritual darkness, we see a spiritual progress of revival. Study the dark times and the dark ages. Study what happened when we came out in the Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation started with uh, there with Luther on the steps. And he declared that the just shall live by faith. And the great Reformation broke out. Then we talk about the Great Awakening. Did you know that the Great Awakening after the Great Awakening came after the Dark Ages? It came after they were killing Christians, Bibles were burning them at the stake, all the persecution in the days of the dark days, and out of that rose the Great Awakening. Let me tell you, say this: the darker the night, the brighter the light. Amen. Why? Jesus is the light of the world in any dark corner. And thirdly, why I'm not discouraged, because Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to tell you, Washington Supreme Court administration, you can do all you want to to silence the church, stop the gospel, quit building the church. But I want to tell you something. Jesus said hell isn't even going to prevail. So guess what, Washington? Neither will you. Amen. Supreme Court, neither will you. You humanist, neither will you. Atheist, neither will you. And that list could go on and on. But it will not prevail against God's church. You want to know why? Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will continue to go forth. Whether the churches are shut down, you won't stop the gospel. Whether the churches don't have buildings, you won't stop the church because we're the church. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you something. As the gospel goes out around the globe, people are being saved by the thousands and Jesus is adding to his church every day hallelujah to the glory of God oh praise his name friend if you're here today without Christ let me encourage you to be saved and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ you don't need to be going away from here discouraged you need to go away from here happy and shouting nobody's kicked God off the throne and they're not going to the devil himself tried, didn't he? And he didn't succeed. And neither will Washington or the courts of this land. Or neither will any of the other kings and presidents around this globe. 
You know why? Because he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. And he's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He sits on the circumference of the earth, and it's his footstool. And he holds everything in place and in order till it's ready. Oh, you see, Jesus adds to his church every day as people get saved and born again. And turn today, if you have not done that, let me encourage you, invite you to do so, to come to Christ. Those of you that have been watching with us, internet, television, radio, iTunes, iPhones, or whatever, YouTube, you know, I'm not on that all stuff. iPhones, iPads, tablets, I'll leave that to the mastermind over here. Amen. I want to tell you, you can come to Christ today. And I didn't say you'll ex- escape all of this that's coming, but you'll go through it not alone with the Lord Jesus. And then there will be that day when it's his time we're out of here are you ready for the trip you ready to make the journey friend if you died today are you 100% sure you know you'd go to heaven if not why not do it today Jesus said he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life and he that believeth not the son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him May we pray together. Father, we trust today that once again you will take your word, your thoughts, your message, and deliver to the hearts of people, the minds of people. Those of you that may be here today and you've never trusted Christ, you've never been saved. In just a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to do so. Those of you that are watching by television, listening, watching with us, same thing. We want to give you an opportunity today to come to Christ. The Bible says if we will confess with our mouth, believe in our heart, call upon Him and receive Him, we shall be saved. We're going to do that right now here in this auditorium and those of you that are with us through the media and watching and listening. Wherever you are around the globe, would you simply pray with us? Remember, it's not the prayer that saves you, but it's putting your faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross of Calvary and trusting and believing in that, my friend. You shall have eternal life, everlasting life. And the song that Marvin sang about in the beginning, one day will be your home too. And you won't just call it heaven. You'll call it home. How about it? Let's pray together. Those of you that are here as well, simply pray, dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And He will, my friend, He will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for me. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe now that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the record the Scriptures recorded in truth. And right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and invite you and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die. I pray this prayer in faith believing in Jesus' name. Oh, my friend, if you prayed that prayer with us today in this auditorium, would you slip your hand up long enough for us to see it and put it right back down? Anyone like that today, come to Christ. Trust Him. Oh, if you have, raise your hand. We want to just shout and rejoice with you that you've come to know Jesus. Friend, if you've taken care of all that and you've got that down, then this is a good time for the church to be renewed in our zeal, in our drive, our commission, to get the gospel message out because it's more powerful than anything in all the world. We have windows of opportunity right now. But I'm afraid and believe that they're going to be closing shortly so we must work while it is day for the night is coming when no man can work and you could vow a vow to the Lord or promise to the Lord or renew your commitment afresh and new that you're going to serve Christ you're going to be a greater and stronger testimony and witness and share the gospel and by all means help him ask him to help you take a stand 
for Christ. Be a part of those that will stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ that you read this morning. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross. Oh, whatever it is that God's dealing with you. Church, I want to remind you, we are a mighty army for Jesus Christ. And we cannot be stopped on the authority of God's Word. The church will triumph.